again friends and loyal wolf pack members, Chaos Wolf here and welcome back to the Elite Dangerous 2.2 beta server. And what we're going to be having a look at now is this little beauty, the Beluga Liner. Now this is going to be the largest of the... Oh, as it's that large I can barely get my camera around it without clipping into the walls. Now this is the largest of the passenger vessels and you can see just that from the side it really does look like just a futuristic kind of passenger liner and that's essentially exactly what it is i mean it's basically just a cruise liner for space and you can see it's that big or that long it literally goes up right to the back side of <laughs> of the hangar so it is absolutely huge. We can get a look at the engines around the back, but we are having to clip through the wall in order to do this. So, yeah. I think next time we try this, I might want to go try this outside in the depths of space. So at least then we might have enough space to do this. But yeah, it is a good, good looking ship. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how it handles and how it flies. I mean, let's just have a look at the landing gear as well. That's kind of unique as well. They've completely designed a new landing gear for it. Well, unless potentially that may be for the Orca as well. I don't know. I've never owned an Orca. I used it once. I don't really remember. I'd have to go back and check. But it does look very, very swanky. And having a ship like this, you'd expect it to have one of the Imperial style cockpits. But that is not the case. This ship does not have an Imperial cockpit. But just look, there we go. Up the top is where the observational deck is going to be, where all the all the passengers are going to be able to see everything out of the viewing window. So that's like the viewing deck. I've got to imagine, I can't wait to walk around ships and see what that looks like inside. But the cockpit is actually down here, the front section there. You can't see in because it's tinted glass. But um, let's actually go and have a look inside and see what it looks like. Here we go. So here we are inside, and I've got to say, it looks like a cross between a Anaconda and a... Hmm... And a Corvette, a Federal Corvette cockpit. So it looks very practical. We've got one co-pilot seat off to the left, one off to the right. And I think that's it. But you've got to see the bridge appears to be really huge. And look at that. And there's no hang wires either to go and aggravate certain OCD commanders. So, yeah, I've got to say, it does look very, very nice. It's got different consoles over there and over here, although they do look like they're mirrored, potentially. Yes, yes, they're just mirrored on either side. Okay. Alrighty, so no coffee dispensers, but we do have these little weird purple dots around. But anyway, I am waffling now. So, anyway, let's go into the starport services, go into the shipyard. And let's go and see how much this ship will set you back. Now, it's not as much as I was first expecting. Now, yes, you may think that this is only saying 8.2 million, but this is actually going to be 82 million. Because how the beta server works, and you can tell it's the beta server because it tells you down here, uh, what happens is everything is one tenth of its normal price. So basically move the decimal point across one, to the right and that's the actual price you're going to be paying so this is actually going to be 82 million four hundred and nineteen thousand four hundred and fifty credits so that's what you can expect to pay for a beluga liner and I, to be perfect honest, that seems a little bit on the cheap side to me so because let's have a look for the anaconda it's going to, the anaconda is 143 million so again moving the decimal place across one uh, the Corvette is 183 million, again moving the decimal place across, and this would be 203 million, again moving the decimal place across. Now, you may be asking, Chaos, why are you bringing so much attention to the pricing of these ships and the fact that you need to move the decimal point? Well, the reason I'm drawing so much attention to this is because every 
time I make a beta video and talk about prices somebody has to get into the comments and go go learn to go to school and count or something along the the lines of such but oh well I just want to make sure that it's completely out in the open and there's going to be no idiots writing in the comments but anyway let's move on shall we so as we can see it's not the most expensive of ships so that is kind of nice because it's not as expensive as the anaconda or the cutter or the corvette so that's kind of nice but it is a lot bigger now i suspect this is the new largest ship in the game but anyway let's move on and let's have a look at how much this is actually going to go and cost to outfit or at least roughly what you can get for it. So hard points, we'll go and have a look at these quick. Now as you can go and see, we've actually gone and got five medium hard points. So they're not the biggest hard points, and they're not the smallest hard points either. So I do suspect that these are probably going to be best utilised with, with turreted weapons, I suspect. Maybe turreted beams or something. We'll have to see. But it's going to be interesting. I just spotted this spinning thing on the top there oh very nice getting distracted again utility mounts how many have we got one two three four five six six utility mounts so that's not bad either now what exactly you're going to be using them for i'm not quite sure potentially eh, i don't know really up to you i suppose core internals let's go and have a look well you've got the lightweight alloy the standard alloys let's go and see how much these would cost if you for some reason wanted to go and put on reinforced or military grade now, reinforced alloys, we 32, basically 33 million all but the kicking and screaming. Remember, we have to move the decimal point because this is only one tenth of the lifesaver prices. Uh, military grade would be 47.2 million all but the kicking and screaming. Mirrored, seven, 175 million. And reactive, virtually 200 million. So, yeah, this is going to be an expensive ship to go and upgrade with bulkheads but it's a commercial vet it's not a commercial vessel it's a luxury vessel why would you want to go and do this i don't know perhaps somebody wants to make it into a battle barge i don't know but power plant it's a class six let's go and have a look shall we so we'll go for class high to low most expensive ones can be 15.7 million remember move the decimal point but yes so that's what it's going to be to get the best of that the thrusters are class seven so that is going to be 50 million, remember? Decimal point moving, remember? Then we've got the frame shift drive, which is again a class 7. And that again is going to be 50 million. Again, remembering to move. I keep saying this because I know somebody's going to be skimming through this and actually going, Oh, but you didn't say it was this. Yes, I did. I've said it like about 20 times by now. But oh well. Life support is a class 8, and that's going to set you back 26.5 million all but the kicking and screaming power distributor let's see that is going to be 3 million so that's not bad Oop, sensors let's have a look at these this is going to be 1.2 million i believe remember move the decimal point and as we can see with the standard frame shift drive we've got a 9.52 light year jump range so that's not bad straight out of the box but I'm curious, what are you going to get it to if we go up to the top? Just look at that, 20.07 light years. That's just out of the box with just the upgrade to the frame shift drive. So the jump range on this thing is not terrible. It could be a lot better, but it also could be a lot worse. But let's go back and we'll go and have a look at the optional internals. Now, as you can see, it's only got a class 6 shield generator. So that's going to mean that the shields are not going to be that strong we've got th oh wow four class six internals two class fives one class four four class threes and a class one but obviously the class one is the planetary approach suite so we've got a bunch of internal compartments and depending on how you want to go and set this up whether or not you want to go and drop down the shield generator you're going to either be able to get a lot of cargo or a lot of passenger cabins in here now it is worth noting that not every single one of these actually is able to go and put everything in there. If we have a look at this one, we can only put cargo racks, hull reinforcements or passenger cabins. I suspect that is the module that's going to be underneath the main viewing deck. 
we've also gone and got, if we go here, we've got the cargo racks. Now here we can virtually go and put whatever the hell we want. Now we have got fighter hangers, so we could theoretically go and put one of those, but it goes to show that fighter hangers are only up, basically only down to class 5. So they have to be from class 5 or up. So bear that in mind when you're building your ships or when you're planning your ship builds. I'm curious now how many, what this is going to look like with pure cargo racks. So let's go and find out how much we, how much cargo we could actually go and fit in this ship. Okay, so here we are, filled with nothing but cargo racks. We can see that our grand total of cargo is actually 368 tons. So it'd be a very pretty way of transferring cargo around, but it's not going to be one of the best cargo ships around. I'm pretty sure a Type 9 would probably be netting you a lot more money, because you can get around about 500 tons of cargo out of a Type 9. A little bit, about 450 out of an Anaconda. So, yeah, yes, these the Anaconda is more expensive, the Type 9 has a lower jump range. So this may be a nice middle ground ship, it's really up to you. But with the standard jump range of 8.4, it's not going to be great, but that is with the E-rated frameshift drive. So that would go up, obviously, if we had it completely upgraded. Into the core internals, to the frameshift drive. So, 17.71 light years, fully laden with nothing but cargo. That's not too bad, I've got to say. Like I said, it'd be a very pretty way of transferring the cargo around, but it's really up to you. But let's go and have a look at how this would look with cabins instead. Alrighty, so we now have this set up for passengers. Now, I have gone and found out that neither of the Class 5s will actually allow you to fit a shield generator. And class 4 or below, it's just too small of a shield generator to be able to actually protect your ship. So you are quite limited to a class 6 shield generator. Now you can happily run without if you're feeling brave enough, but that's totally up to you. But the way I look at this, I think 3 class 6 economy class cabins are probably the best course of action. 2 5B luxury cabins a class 4 business class cabin because for some reason you can't get class 5 business cabins because I was originally planning to have the these as business class cabins and then the class 4 as a luxury cabin and potentially a couple of class 3 uh, luxury cabins as well but that's just not how it works and not only that but you cannot actually go and fit let's have a look here we go there are no cabins that you can fit in class 3 or smaller compartments so, yeah, there's that. So, basically, anything class, any of the four class three slots, you're going to have to fill up with other things. But, yeah, uh, discovery scanners, docking computers, whatever the hell you want to put in here, that'll be what it is. Well, let's see. We would have, let's go and have a look, actually, because we can't really see how many passengers we get all that well from here. Let's have a look here. So, here we are in the passenger lounge, and we have a bunch of tourists. Let's have a look here. So, ooh, let's have a look at this. Economy cabins. We have three economy cabins, and that would give us a grand total of 96 people. So that's going to be 32 slots per Class 6 economy cabin. So that's interesting. Now we've also got one business cabin, but that's too many for that these people here. And they will not go into luxury cabins, so let's go and decline that mission. And we can go and have a look at this one. So let's go down. Now, they could come into economy. They could go into this economy one as well. But the problem is they would take up the entire thing with their entire entourage. So we could go and dump them into business. Or we could even dump them into one of the luxury ones. So that they don't take up the vast majority of the ship. So that's interesting. Personally, I'd be tempted to just dump them into business if we could actually get away with it. And here we go, we have a guy that insists on going luxury or nothing. In fact, it even seems like it's actually six of them, so it may even be a boy band for all we know. Unfortunately, we can't go and vent the cabin out into a star, but oh well. But yeah, that is pretty much how I would think of setting this up. I mean, we could set it up completely differently if we wanted and have larger first-class cabins or so on. It's really not a massive problem. 
But anyway, let's get outside and go and see how well this thing handles. Okay, so first of all, what we're going to go and do is we're going to go and try a pitch test. So what we're going to do is we are going to go and line up the little mouse widget in the middle of the screen up with a local star. We're going to go and have all four pips into engines go up to the sweet spot. So there we go, we're cruising at a nice healthy 90 odd meters per second. So what we're going to do is just pitch back and see roughly how long it takes to go and turn around a full 360 degrees. There you go, we passed it. If you want to go into time exactly how long that takes, that's fine. I just wanted to show you a rough thing. It doesn't feel like it handles all that badly. But what we're going to go and do now is we're going to go and see how quickly this thing accelerates on stock thrusters up to full. I've got to say, that was kind of interesting. It accelerates fairly quickly, and not only that, it has a very interesting sound to it, especially since it builds towards the end. But let's hear how it sounds when it boosts, and let's see what its stock boost speed is. So 173-ish on the boost speed, and I've got to say that boost sounded quite interesting. Let's see if we can beat 273. Nope, I think 273 is the maximum boost you can get on the stock thrusters. So let's see how well this thing actually goes with a boost turn. Not very well, as we would expect. And with doing that, we actually managed to flip the ship over and make it go backwards. But I want to see now, it's something I've not tried before in one of these reviews, is I want to go and see how well this does with a flight assist off boost turn. That's not too bad, so you can potentially use that manoeuvre to try and get out of danger a little bit faster than you normally would. But I've got to say, this ship does not handle like a big, heavy ship. It handles kind of nice. Yes, it's a little slow, but I do think this is actually quite agreeable to handle. And this is only with the stock thrusters. I'm curious to see how this actually goes with the a fully A-rated. But I'm going to be covering that in a different video. But anyway, let's go and dock and let's see what I think of this so far. Now, I've got to say, getting this thing through the mail slot was not as hard as I was led to believe. So, let's get it let, set down on the pad and see how easy it is to do so. Because there is a little bit of drift, but it is also very responsive for the large style ship that I was expecting it to be. It does have a very small stopping distance. So that is very nice as well. And this is all with the stock thrusters. So I'm really curious to see how well that works fully A-rated. But let's get into the hangar and see what I think about the ship so far. So, what do I think of the Beluga liner? Well, I think it's an interesting ship and I think it handles a lot better than I was expecting it to. I was fully expecting this to handle like an anaconda, perhaps like the cutter. I was expecting just because of how big this ship is supposed to be. But I was pleasantly surprised to find it handles a lot, lot better. And I'm really curious to see how well this ship will handle once it's been A-rated and then again once it's been A-rated and modified. 
So I'm really curious to see what we can get out of this ship. I suspect we're going to be able to get a fairly nice jump range out of it. If we set it up similarly to an explorer ship where we go for as the lightest possible items we can go for, that's going to make this a much better passenger liner, I think, because I don't think we're going to want to go and armor plate it. Because potentially we may want to if we have very important people on, but I don't think I'm really, we're really going to want to do that. Because we're not going to be able to fight our way out of anything. We've got five medium hard points. So, yeah, that's rather curious. But anyway, I do hope you've enjoyed this video and the look at the Beluga liner, at least the stock version. We are going to be going and having a look at it A-rated, but I didn't want to lump it all into one video because it'd just be way too long. But anyway, I do hope you've enjoyed the video. Like it if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't. Neither of those good enough for you, that's what the comments are for. But anyway guys, I've been Commander Chaos Wolf. You guys have been epic. I will see you soon. And until next time, Commanders, keep flying and stay shiny. <laughs>